Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Skyline family. If you're joining us from your home or living room or watching us from out of town or another part of the world, great to have you with us. We love you and you're part of our family. Why don't you take a moment uh, to indicate in the chat box where you're viewing us from, whether it's from another town or city in a different part of the world. Why don't you make your town, city or nation famous for this next hour? Today, we continue with our sermon series on one thing. Somebody say one thing. That's great. There are five one things in the Bible that God wants to remind us in this pandemic. This is our third in the series. Now, many people have one thing that have made them famous. Steve Jobs will always be remembered for the one thing, Apple. Elon Musk will be remembered for the one thing, SpaceX. Obama will be remembered for the one thing as being the first black American president. Sai, on the other hand, will be remembered for his one thing, the billion viewer hit Opa Gangnam Style. What's your one thing? Now, one day a woman woke up in the morning and said to her husband, she said, you know, last night you asked me what one thing would I like for my birthday? Strangely enough, she said, last night I had a dream. I dreamt that you gave me a diamond necklace on my birthday. What on earth could this mean? And the husband was grinning from ear to ear, looked at her and said, tonight, you will find out. And sure enough, that evening when he came from, from home from work, he brought her her birthday present, a book on how to interpret your dreams. Last week's one thing was learning to listen. Uh, there is no greater need than to listen to his voice in the midst of all the noise in the world today. And we drew that lesson from the story of Martha and Mary. Today's one thing comes from the encounter between the rich young ruler and Jesus when he asked the Lord, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The Bible tells us that in Luke 18 verse 22, that when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have, Give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. I've entitled today's message, One Thing That Matters. Let's read the passage in Luke 18, beginning from verse 18 onwards. And a ruler asked him, that's Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not fair, bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Let me shed light on this passage by asking three questions. The first question is this, this command of Jesus, one thing you lack, sell all you have and give to the poor and follow me. Is this command to all of us or to the rich young ruler only? That's, that's crucial for us to know. If he's saying to all of us, if this command is meant for all of us, then Jesus should have said this command to every rich believer in the gospel as well, like Jairus or Nicodemus, or Zacchaeus, or the Roman centurion. But no, he didn't. So the issue is not about money or being rich and wanting to follow Jesus. I hear a sigh of relief now, you know, phew, there's no need for us to empty our bank accounts or to rush out and give all to the Salvation Army or to Skyline's COVID fund. Yeah. Jesus was saying this to the rich young ruler only. He was just saying it to the rich young ruler only. That is the context. Why? Because there were problems with regard to his heart. And here's the second question. 
What was the problem with his heart? Why did Jesus make such radical demands on this young man? You know, go sell all you have, give to the poor, and then come and follow me. He never even said these things to his disciples. He said to his disciples, come and follow me. But why did he give such a radical command uh, to the rich young ruler? Why then? Well, it was simply because of this. Because the rich young ruler was using this as an opportunity to show off. Do you like show-offs? Well, most of us don't like show-offs. You know, there was a man who had a charismatic dog. And that dog was Pentecostal charismatic to go all the things. Like when you ask him to worship, he will lift up his paws. When you ask him to pray, he would put his paws together. You know, when you read the Bible and sing along, he would be barking. And this man was showing off this dog to all his friends. And his friends said, that's very impressive. But, but can your dog do normal things like sit or stand or roll or heal? And the man said, well, let's try. So he, he said to the dog, heal. And immediately the dog stood on its heels, lifted up its paws and laid hands on another dog and started praying in tongues. You see, even that dog you know, can do things that we human beings would not want to do. She was a show-off dog, but a young man wanted to show off his righteousness. He came to Jesus from a totally wrong angle. The angle of self-achievements, the angle of self-righteousness, the angle of fulfillment of the law. And when he did so, Jesus gave him the full fiery blast of the law. You know, one group of people always got on the wrong side of Jesus. They were the self-righteous people. And this young man was no exception. You see, the Pharisees in the Bible always got onto the wrong side of Jesus. They were the people that were always proclaiming the self-righteousness, and they were the people he never, ever liked. It reminds me of a story of a young man whose mother was always persuading him to get married, you know, and he, eventually he found the girl of his dreams, and he brought her back home, but he decided just to, to you know, try out his mother. Uh, he brought her back home with about three other girls. So there were four girls all together. And they came and they met the mother. And somewhere during that time, he went into the kitchen. And the mother, when the mother was in the kitchen, he said, Mom, which girl do you think? You know, that, uh, that the girl of my dreams amongst the, these four that I've chosen. And the mother said, the one with the long hair and the curls at the end, the black hair. That's right, said the young man. Mom, how did you know? Well, said the mom. That's the only one I don't like. That must be the one. Well, you know, it's the same here. You know, the Pharisees always got onto the wrong side of Jesus. The young man was using his opportunity to show off his righteousness. And that's why Jesus responded with this overwhelming command and demand from him. Here's the third question. How can we be sure that this was the state of the young man's heart? Well, because he went away sorrowful when he did not want to do what Jesus asked of him. When he heard these things, the Bible tells us, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Verse 23, Mark tells us he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He was sad because he was shown up. He did not want to go through the whole way to inherit eternal life, sell his goods and give to the poor. He didn't have it in him. Yet he never ever looked elsewhere. He never looked up the one thing that was really on offer by Jesus that really mattered. What was the one thing that was always on offer to him? To understand what it is, let's take a look at the whole incident together. You see, Jesus was nearing Jericho. He was on his way to Jerusalem. Crowds were were, were milling around him, especially kids. In fact, they had so many kids that the disciples were having a hard time trying to shoo all the kids away. And uh, Jesus turned to the disciples and said, do not forbid the children to come to me. And then he began to bless the children and pray for them. And so everything was a little bit hush by that time. If you have kids, the parents were there, the disciples were there, they formed the crowd. And suddenly in the midst of this, after Jesus had blessed the children, a young man came rushing in and knelt before Jesus and said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
It was a dramatic entrance. Luke's gospel called him a ruler of the Jewish synagogue. Matthew's gospel calls him a young man. All three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tells us he was very rich. So we call him the rich young ruler. The crowds on seeing this man kneeling before Jesus and asking this question, they were stunned. You see, rich rulers don't normally bow or kneel before rabbis. But Jesus wasn't in the least stunned. He saw through three things in him. Firstly, Jesus saw through his pretense. You see, Jesus didn't answer the question. He challenged the greeting first. He didn't answer the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He challenged the greeting, good teacher. Good, Jesus says. Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Why did he do that? When we read the Gospels, we see that when people call Jesus as rabbi or master or, or even Lord, Jesus never challenged a greeting. This is the only one time that he ever challenged a greeting. Why? Well, at first glance, this greeting, good teacher, seems just like another honorific. Like we say, good sir, kind sir. But when we look at the rabbinical literature, we find that there is actually no record in Jewish literature in which rabbis are ever addressed as good teacher. It didn't exist. So this greeting was made up by the young man, you know, as he approached Jesus in order for one thing only, to flatter Jesus. It's like calling someone a datto repeatedly when he's actually not a datto. It's like when a stranger comes up to you and say, what a hao peng yo, han jiu mi chen. Hey, my good friend. He's a stranger. He says, hey, my good friend. When he addresses you like that, you know there is an ulterior motive. So Jesus addressed the greeting first. He saw through this young man's pretense. Secondly, Jesus saw through his boast. What was his boast? Now notice the way he framed his question. What must I do? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, everybody was listening to him. You see, he already knew his firm foundation and his base. He was asking from a position of strength. He was a religious Jewish man, a ruler of the synagogue. He was observant of, he was observant of everything in the law, even to the letter. What else, he was asking Jesus, must I do according to the law? So he came to Jesus from the angle of the law. And he was very confident to show off to the crowd his perfection under the law. So it was all schemed up. What must I do, Master, to inherit eternal life? It's like someone scoring five A stars in his A levels or STPM, or someone who scored a perfect score in his SAT exam and asked the teacher in front of the whole class, Sir, what grades do I need to get into Harvard? And the answer would be five A's. I've already got it. Or a perfect set score. I've, oh, I, I see. I've already got it. That was his perspective. Because he came from the angle of the law, Jesus gave him the standard reply to test his heart. Jesus answered him, you know the law, and so he should, because he's the ruler of the synagogue. The law says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Back came the reply in the flash from the young man. All these things I have kept from my youth. The crowd gasped. It was a stunning reply. The rich young ruler was every mother-in-law's dream boy. He was all goodness. And on top of that, he had all the seas. He had cash. He had car. He had club. He had condo, he had credit card, he had character. He was a good boy, a rich boy who would never have mistresses. He was perfect. He was every mother-in-law's dream for a son-in-law that would marry his daughter. But Jesus saw through all his self-righteousness. Not only that, Jesus thirdly exposed his false righteousness. Now, only Mark's gospel tells us at this point that when Jesus heard this, he looked at the young man and loved him. 
Why was that? Because he knew that this young man had a kind of a hunger for God. But he didn't know he was a million miles off the mark. You know, in outer space, when you do astronomy, you know, a minuscule of a fraction of a degree in an angle would put you a million miles off your mark. See, this young man thought that he had fulfilled every one of the 613 commandments of the Jewish law. But he thought wrong. Because the law says these words, if you have broken one law, you have broken all. James 2 verse 10, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point, he is guilty of breaking all of it. Deuteronomy 27 verse 26, cursed is the one who does not confirm all the works of the law. In other words, you break one, you break all. So Jesus said to him, one thing you still lack. Lack means you're coming short of it. You have not fulfilled. Sell all you have and come and follow me. Why did Jesus do that? Because immediately Jesus was addressing his heart. And when the young man heard this, immediately this man knew he was disqualified. The Bible tells us he went away shattered. Why? Because he had broken the first commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Was he not loving God? No, he had made money his God. He loved God. He loved the money more than God. Money was his God. And therefore, he would not. He could not do what Jesus said because that was the true test of where his heart's priority and worship lay. So in effect, he had broken the first commandment. According to the laws of Moses, if you have broken one commandment, you have broken all. Every single law of Moses had been broken by him. And he walked away absolutely shattered. Jesus saw through his false pretense. You know, in my days, when I was doing exams, public exams in Form 5, it was the old Malaysian Certificate of Education. In those days, if you fail BM or if you fail English, you don't get a cert. You fail one, you fail all. It's the same today, I'm, under, I'm, I'm told, that in SBM, you fail BM, you fail all. It's something like that. You don't get the certificate. And so Jesus showed up, his false righteousness. Jesus was saying to him, essentially, you come to me to show off your righteousness by the law? Is that what you base your right to inherit eternal life by? You come to me to show off your righteousness under the law? I will give you the full demands, the full fiery blast of the law. And the moment Jesus said that, he knew he was disqualified. See, the law will never make us just. The law, will be like a, the law is always like a mirror showing us all our sins, our warts, our hideousness, but it has no power to set us free. It shows us our moral bankruptcy, but it has no power to bring us to heaven. The law is so binding and so constricting to the point that Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Have you ever seen a camel go through the eye of a needle? Well, if you've ever ridden on a camel or touched a camel before, you know how tough its skin and how tough its flesh is. People tell me that camel meat, you know, is really tough. I asked somebody in the Middle East once, you know, have you ever tasted camel meat? He said, yeah. I said, how do you cook camel meat? He said, it's very easy. Firstly, you slaughter the camel, then you chop up the camel into, into pieces, then you put it into a big iron cauldron, steel cauldron. You put it in, you add the salt and some of your spices in, and, then, and you throw in some rocks as well. Put some rocks in as well. And, and you boil the camel for about 24 hours. You know, you put a lid on it, a steel lid on it, and you put boulders on top of the lid. And after boiling for 24 hours, you know, you take the boulders away, you remove the lid, and then you take out the camel meat and throw all the camel meat away and you eat the rocks. It's as tough as that, camel meat. And that's why Jesus said, 
it is tougher for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because for many people, there's a money, there's a worship of money, which makes money their God. But still, this passage has not told us the one thing that matters. If the one thing, if the one thing that matters is not the selling of your goods to the poor yeah, and giving the money to the poor, then what is the one thing that will enable us to inherit eternal life? Matthew and Mark's Gospels, which relate this incident of the rich young ruler, leaves us hanging. It tells us what the one thing is not. We all know that the one thing is not about selling your goods, giving to the poor, and following Jesus. That's not the one thing. It applied to the rich young ruler only. But what is the one thing that Jesus is trying to tell us? Well, Matthew and Mark's gospel leaves us hanging. It tells us what the one thing is not, but doesn't tell us what the one thing is. Only Luke's gospel would tell us what the true one thing is. Because only Luke's gospel would follow up this story of the rich young ruler with the story of an equally rich man called Zacchaeus just a few verses later. When we contrast this story, the story of Zacchaeus, with that of the rich young ruler, then one thing that really matters leaps out of the pages of the Bible at us. Let's read now the story of Zacchaeus to find out what the one thing truly is that matters. Luke 19 verses 1 to 10. Jesus entered Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on, on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be with the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And I have defrauded, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come into this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. See, both the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus were similar. They were both rich, powerful, and influential in their own ways. Both were seeking God, but what was the difference? One based, one based his righteousness on his works because he was a righteous man. The other, seeking Jesus, was based on desperation because he was a sinful man. One was religious, the other was corrupt. One was respected in society, the other was hated. One had clean money, the other had dirty money. One came to Jesus in pride to demonstrate his righteousness. The other came to Jesus in shame to hide his sinfulness. But here's the point. One missed God, the other was found by God. What was the difference? One came by works of law, the other came by grace. And that is the one thing that matters. If only the rich young ruler had asked, Jesus, now that I know I'm a sinner and a lawbreaker, I cannot even save myself by the law. Is there another one thing that can save me? Jesus would have said, yes, yes, yes. Look at me. I am your salvation. Don't trust in your law keeping. Trust in me. But he never asked it. Galatians 2.16 tells us, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Ephesians 2.8 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift from God. Let me tell you a story of what grace looks like. Many years ago, I was scheduled to speak at a big Anglican conference in St. Mary's Cathedral in KL. And uh, it was on a Saturday afternoon uh, that the conference was meant to take place at five o'clock in the afternoon. I was catching the last flight that would reach KL on time. 
it was just around midday. The last flight that would get there on time for me, just past midday. I went to the, to the, the airport uh, with my boarding pass and then realized I'd forgotten to bring my IC. And uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't get through the, the counter, the immigration clearance counter. And uh, I tried to plead and beg with them. It was too late to go back home to get my IC. And I said, you know, I'm Dr. Philip. And they said, I, we know who you are, but we still can't let you through without your IC. I said, what about my driver's license? They said, no, sorry, we can't, we can't let you through. I left my IC at home. I said, what way is there for me to get through? And the guy said, well, you can try my officer. He's in, in the basement somewhere in an office at the far end of the airport. So I ran all the way there, I crashed into the office and saw that he was there. There was one immigration officer there, but there were about 20, 30 people in that room, all kind of migrants, refugees or whatever. And I knew that I didn't have a chance to catch his attention. But suddenly he looked up. He saw me and said, he called me over. And he said, what do you want? I explained my situation to him. He said, you're a doctor and you're so forgetful. But he said, you know, I'll, you know, buggy chance. So, you know, I, I'll do this for you, this, this once. He signed at the back of my boarding pass to ask the immigration to let me through. And with that, I got through the immigration. I ran all the way to my flight to my, and, and boarded just in time. As I got into the plane, the door shut. And I was able to get to KL just in time. The bishop met me at the airport and said, was there any problems? I said, no, there was no problems. So I went to the cathedral, spoke to a couple of thousands of people in St. Um, Mary's Cathedral in KL. I made it just on time. But the next day I had to come back. How do I get back without an IC? It was too late for anybody to courier the IC to me because it was a weekend. So I rang my nurse and said, you know, we have a patient who is an immigration officer. Maybe you can ask them just to, to let me through. The, well, how do you contact immigration over the weekend? It's impossible. But anyway, I just left it to God. I got onto the flight because KL coming back, they don't check. In those days before 9-11, they don't check your ICs. You just get your boarding pass and come back. Uh, and when I arrived in KK, this was the problem. I went to the immigration counter and I tried to explain my situation. I said, um, uh, sorry, Dr. Philip, uh, you know, uh, Kamarin Dulu, and I tried to explain the situation. Oh, Dr. Philip, the immigration officer said. And he stuck his head out of the counter and told all the rest of the immigration officers, ah, sudah ada di sini, dah tak payah sudah, ada di sini. So obviously somebody had informed him to be on the lookout for me. And with that, I cleared through and came back in. What was that? That's grace. I don't deserve it. You know, it's been done not once, but twice for me. Again and again, I could have not done anything to save myself to get onto the flight or to come back in. See, when grace came in, it changed the Kirsten's life completely. See, the the rich young ruler came by his own supposed holiness to get Jesus. Zacchaeus came to get Jesus first in order to get holiness. That's the difference between grace and law. Now we have the contrast between Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler. See, after this story, one was saved by grace. The other was disqualified by law. One was transformed. The other was informed. One was filled with joy. The other was filled with sorrow. One family got saved. The other family was unheard of and untouched. One was filled with overwhelming generosity. Zacchaeus stood up and said, half of my wealth I will give away. And if I defrauded anyone, I'll pay back fourfold. You see, once grace touches our hearts, the purse strings of our hearts are loosened. You must understand this is Zacchaeus. He used to worship money. Money was his God. Now he's giving half his wealth away and repaying fourfold for those whom he's defrauded. You know, once grace touches us, we give and we give and we give. It's the purse strings of our hearts are loosened. Grace fills fills us with generosity towards God like nothing else does. What about the other person? The rich young ruler walked away. He never gave a single cent. Law makes us stingy. One became a public celebration with his salvation. That's the case. The other became a private recluse in his condemnation. One became known. This incredible thing. We know his name. His name is Zacchaeus. The other, well, up to today, we call this man the rich young ruler. We don't know his name. He remained anonymous, nameless 
forever and ever. So long as the scriptures have been with us for the last 2,000 years, the gospel, we know the name of the man who was saved under grace that day. His name was Zacchaeus. Heaven knows his name. The other remained nameless forever. We only know him today as the rich young ruler. As I close today, I want to ask you, do you want to be known in heaven? Do you want to be filled with His joy? Do you want your life to be transformed? Do you want your family to be saved? Then turn to Jesus today and come to Him by faith, believing that He took away your sins and mine on the cross. Receive His love and His forgiveness by grace. This is the one thing that matters. So today, if you have never asked Jesus into your life, grace is extended to you. Jesus took your sins and mine on the cross, died for your sins and mine, rose again from the dead. And if we will open the door of our hearts to Him today, we will have eternal life and forgiveness of our sins. If today, that's your desire, you say, I want to receive Jesus. Will you pray the simple prayer with me? It's a prayer to receive Jesus. And it comes on the screen now and say this prayer meaning it in your heart, and commit your life to Him. Lord Jesus, thank You for Your grace and Your love for me. Today, I come as Zacchaeus did, not like the rich young ruler. Lord, save me. I put my trust in You. Lord, cleanse me from my sins and my wrongs. Lord, heal me and fill me with Your love and forgiveness. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus, you know, there's a QR code on the screen. Why don't you scan that QR code right now and then fill in a little bit of your details and then we, somebody will be in touch with you. Somebody will connect with you. You know, not too long from now, in a very short while, somebody will connect with you to pray with you and to give you a resource to begin your new life in Jesus, because today as you pray that prayer, you have come into the kingdom of God. You have received the grace of God in your life. But before we go, I'd like to do one other thing. I'd like to pray for each and every one of us today. As believers, we were saved by grace. We live for God by grace. We serve God by grace. That's what it should be. We love others by grace. We give by grace. We serve out of our love and gratitude and our response to His grace. And when we do so, we will never burn out in our Christian life. So I want to pray a prayer for us so that we will always chart and live under God's grace. All heads bow now as I pray. Father God, I thank you. This morning, for each and every one under the sound of my voice here, Lord, we see this contrasting story between the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus. Lord, we want to come to you as Zacchaeus did, in the humbleness of our hearts, knowing we cannot save ourselves, but you have come looking for us, just like you did for Zacchaeus. And today, once again, we affirm that by faith, we receive you as our Lord and Savior, and by grace, we live out our lives. This morning, there are some of you who need healing in your lives right now. Put your hand on that part of the body that needs healing. And I pray in Jesus' name right now for the life of Jesus to flow through you, the grace and the healing power of Jesus to flow through you right now. I speak healing into your life, into your family. And some of you are standing in proxy for members of your family. Jesus is here. He's alive today. I pray for that healing to come into the life of your family for your children, your spouse, your family members, your parents right now. Receive that healing in Jesus' name. Some of you may be fearful of what this pandemic and lockdown may be for yourself, for your health, for your business. I want to pray for a second wind of faith in your life because God is the life giver. Jesus is with us. He is our life giver. Lord, I just pray that your life will flow through each and every one of us here today. We receive your life in us right now, Lord. Your life that gives life, your life that heals, 
your life, God, that protects us and covers us, your life that, that brings an anointing of faith in our lives, so that even in the midst of this pandemic, we will be unafraid to share the gospel, to bring the good news, the gospel of your grace, and to others of our friends, our colleagues at work, our family. We believe by grace, we will see many salvations. And we believe by your grace, O oh God, our faith will grow, that we will have a second wind throughout this lockdown and pandemic, that we will rise above the storm because you hold us in the midst of all our challenges. Lord, we give you praise because Lord, like Zacchaeus, Lord, salvation has come into our household and our lives. So we give you praise and thanks and we worship you today in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name. All God's people said, Amen and Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, it's been a joy uh, just ministering God's word to you this morning. I pray that you have been blessed and I trust that you will live the life to the fullest of what God wants for you under His grace, His mercy and His power. Be blessed. Have a great week. Have a great month ahead. And for those of you who are celebrating Chinese New Year, not too long from now, have a great, wonderful Lunar New Year. God bless you all. I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.